in the book of Romans, chapter 10, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. Paul describes the most beautiful plan ever conceived in the infinite mind. God wants to love the human race. He wants for men to link their freedom to his grace. And the result of this docking, of this union, results in what we call salvation. The plan of salvation is God's way of taking imperfect human beings and putting them into a perfect heaven and in filling them with a perfect relationship of salvation that never dims or dies that never fades nor fails. You know, a redeemed sinner is in a better shape, actually, than Adam in the Garden of Eden. A child of God has a more intimate position with God than Adam in the environment of the Garden. Because, you see, Adam could lose what he had. In fact, God told him, in the day you take of this tree, the forbidden fruit, you will die. But the child of God cannot lose what God gives him at the point of salvation. That's why in John chapter 10 and verse 27, Christ could say, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. They follow me and I give to them eternal life. And by the word, the way the word give in the Greek is the word didomi, which means a gift with no strings attached, says Dr. Vincent Taylor in a beautiful commentary on this scripture. I give to them eternal life. And then he said it a second way. They shall never perish. He came at it negatively. They shall never perish. And the word never in the Greek is a double negative. And that often is used grammatically in Greek to emphasize something, to stress it. They shall never, never perish. The child of God is beyond the touch of condemnation, not because of any merit of his own, but because of the greatness of God and the marvelous provision that he has made in salvation. And then he said another way, and no man can pluck them out of my hand. People often say, well, can't you turn loose of the Lord after you're saved? No, because you're not holding Salvation is not you reaching up and grabbing the nail-pierced hand of Jesus. Salvation is you're lifting up your hand and the Lord reaches down and he takes it. So you cannot turn loose when you're not holding. You cannot turn loose when you're not holding. And you're not holding him at the point of salvation. He's holding you. And so the Bible teaches that what God gives man at the point of accepting his son as Savior... It's an eternal relationship that never dims or dies, that never fades nor fails. All right, look, listen to what Paul says. Brethren, verse 1, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record, they have a zeal of God but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, they go about to establish their own righteousness and they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believeth. Now, the plan of salvation which God gives a human race, the simplicity of it may mystify you. How can a man take our sins on a cross and then we accept that by faith and suddenly a miracle of never-ending relationship is initiated between that subject and the person of the infinite God? That may baffle you. But all you can do is to go through life singing amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Because that miracle that God introduces at the point where you accept him 
is a miracle that uh, cannot be deciphered by the energy of the human mind. No one can draw a blueprint of the grace of God. No one can decipher the mystery of infinite grace. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12, the writer said even the angels are baffled by it. They would desire to look into it. And the word to look in in, in the Greek means to analyze it and to tear it open and to uh, try to understand its anatomy and decipher its mechanics. But man cannot do it. He's just the recipient. All you can do is to furnish the sinner. God furnishes the Savior. And this beautiful and wonderful plan which God has proposed for every member of the human race and simplified it so everybody who wants to be saved can be saved is the object, it, it, it is the, come, it stems from his love for us. He loved us that much. That's why he made it simple. He loved us so boys and girls could accept it and men and women of every walk of life could receive it. This wonderful way that God has of taking imperfect creatures and in one beautiful, magnificent stroke making them sons of God forever and giving them a place in a perfect heaven which they don't deserve. No wonder Paul could say in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, by the grace of God, I am what I am. The love of God, he said, is the only thing that makes sense to me. And the only thing that is worth living for and worth dying for is the grace of God. And the thing that makes life meaningful upon the earth is the wonderful grace of God. Whenever anything baffles you, just accept it in the word of God. Don't impose your lack of knowledge and your limitation, your finite knowing, because you don't understand it. There must be something wrong with that. You put the blame where it belongs upon your limited knowledge. You know, I used to have a preacher friend who used to say, the Bible says it, and I believe it, and that settles it. And for a long time, I used to think, that's a beautiful statement. The Bible says it. I believe it. That settles it. But one day, I began to break that statement down, and that isn't actually correct. The Bible says it, and that settles it. Whether anyone ever believes it or not. The Bible stands, the word of God stands true, no matter what human experience may say. Don't ever build your theology upon what a man feels or a man thinks or what's happened to somebody in a certain situation. What does the Bible teach? What does the word of God say? And this wonderful salvation is available to every member of the human race. Though your sins be as scarlet, said Isaiah 118, they can be as white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they can be as wool. You see, the minimum of the atonement can defeat the maximum of the fall. No combination of human corruptions can defeat the grace of God. Nobody can stand at the foot of the cross and say, I'm too hard for you to save. I, I'm too complex. I've sinned too much. Or I'm going to do this or that. Or I've done certain things. This, that or the other. No combination of human corruptions can defeat the grace of God. God is equal to every combination of human sin in life. Though your sins be as scarlet, they can be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they can be as wool. And so God takes men to heaven by a simple step of accepting his only begotten son. Men don't go to heaven for... Uh, doing service. Men, are, you're not on probation. You're not uh, auditioning for the grace of God when you accept him as your savior. The miracle of his love consummates and completes salvation right there and never again will you ever be more saved than you are the moment that you accept him. I've been preaching now and I've been a Christian for 46 years but I was as ready for heaven one minute after I was saved as I am right now after 46 years of preaching and working. My preaching and my working has not earned me more sonship with God. There is no way you can increase an absolute relationship. Take for example, I'm a child of my mother. Almost 60 years ago, I was born to my mother. But I was as much a child of my mother one minute after I was physically born as I am right now at the age of almost 60. Now I'm more mature now and I'm independent now. But that hasn't earned me more sonship or increased. My relationship to my mother and so with God you see when you accept him and did you ever stop to realize there are no VIPs in salvation 
that God gives the same beautiful love and redeeming mercy to every person who comes, no matter what his background may be, what his age may be, what his cultural environment might be, what his genetic pattern might be. Oh, God gives to every one of us the, the beautiful, completed, total salvation at the point that we accept him. So that a little boy coming down to be saved one of these nights is just the same as Billy Graham. And the dying thief was just as saved as Mary, the virgin mother of our Savior. No one gets more. There are no VIPs in salvation. And so Paul here is defining salvation in these four verses. And very simply, I want to show you how he eliminates three popular misconceptions in verses 1, 2, and 3. Because in Paul's day, as in your day and mine, people have uh, ideas. You're saved this way. You're saved by doing that. You're saved by doing the other. But you see, the Bible teaches there's only one way to be saved. Not two. I was in Miami recently and after the service, so I had mentioned the exclusiveness of God's redemptive plan that we're saved only through Christ and not by human effort or by human sincerity. And a woman came up to me and said, oh, I don't agree with that. She said, uh, we live, I live here in Miami and said, uh, for example, you can come into Miami by boat and you can come in by plane and you can come in by, you can walk in, you can come in by automobile. And she said, there are many ways to come into Miami. And so I believe that it's the same uh, with reference to heaven. And I had the joy of saying to her sister, the only thing wrong with your argument is that Miami is not heaven. That's the difference. Now, you can come in many ways into Miami, but there's only one way to go to heaven. Jesus said, I'm the way. John 14, 6, and no man comes to the Father but by me. And so in Paul's day, they had ideas you could do it this way, that way. And Paul is going to eliminate three popular misconceptions in verses 1, 2, and 3. And then in verse 4, he affirms the beautiful and the wonderful plan which God has given the human race. All right, number one, may I begin by saying that we're not, no, we're not saved, we're not saved, number one, and here's the key word, by race, R-A-C-E. We're not saved by race. Verse one, brethren, he's talking to the Jews, the Israelites, the people of the covenant, the chosen people. He said, brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for Israel is that they might be Saved. And I can imagine when Paul said that, everybody gasped in the audience. Looked at one another and said, what does he mean by that? Now, salvation is all right for the Gentile. And salvation is all right for the pagan. And salvation is all right for the outsider. But we're God's chosen people and we don't need to be saved. And there was a popular misconception floating around that if you were a Jew, you were automatically saved. And Paul said, no, sir. I'm praying. Nicodemus, the Pharisee, the Israelite, had to come and Christ said to him, said to him, you must be born again. You're not saved by generation, you're saved by regeneration. You're not saved by chromosomes, you're saved by Calvary. You're not saved by genes, you're saved by Golgotha. Salvation is not something you do for God, it's something God does for you. You're not saved by race. You know, John the Baptist became so irate at that popular misconception that one day in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 9, he pointed to a bunch of rocks and said, God can take these stones and raise up children unto Abraham. They were boasting about their roots. They were, they were glorying in their genealogy. They said, don't talk to us about repentance. We're in good shape. We're not outsiders. We're not Gentiles. We're not pagans. Paul said, you need to be saved through Jesus Christ. I pray that uh, they might be saved. And John the Baptist said, God can take these stones and raise up children unto Abraham. We're not saved by race. Some years ago, I was in an airport. I was in an airport between planes and I sat next to a friend, a man, and began talking with him. And I asked him, I said, are you a Christian? He said, yes, sir. I'm a Christian. He said, what do you think? I'm a heathen. He said, I was born in America. And America is a Christian country. Therefore, I am a Christian. And I had to say to this man, being born in a Christian country does not make you a Christian. No more than being born in a garage would make you an automobile. <laughs> I heard a black preacher say that because, I heard a black preacher say because a mother cat has kittens in the oven, that doesn't make them biscuits. 
You see, the environmental situation does not change the inner condition. And so, we're not saved by race. We're not saved by race. Number one, everybody has to be born again. Did you ever stop to realize that God has no grandchildren? Now, some of you parents may feel sorry. Grandparents may feel sorry for him about that. But God has no grandchildren. You heard the story about the man who was talking to his friend and he said, Hey, have I told you about my grandkids? And the other man said, No, and I sure do appreciate it. <laughs> because grandparents are so loquacious about those little ones. But anyway, when I say, God has no grandchildren. I have two boys and those two boys were saved when they were seven years old. Because they were born into a preacher's home, that didn't automatically make them sons of God. You cannot transmit spirituality genetically. You may pass on the family name and the family fortune, but you cannot transmit salvation from one parent to a, the next generation. And you see, when those two boys became Christians, they became my brothers. The spiritual experience reversed the relationship. And I'm their physical father, but spiritually, they're my brothers. Number one, we're not saved by race. All right, number two, we're not saved by religion. The key word is the word religion. The next verse says, For they have a zeal of God. Talking about the Jews. They have a, a zeal of God. But not according to knowledge. Paul said, My people are not atheists. They believe in God. Not only do they believe in God, they have an enthusiasm for Him. The Greek word means to burn, to be energetic they have an enthusiasm about monotheism but you know in James 2 19 the Bible says the devils believe in God and they tremble that doesn't make them Christians because they are theistic you know we only have atheists among human beings demons are not atheists they believe in God they've seen his power they have felt his presence. Paul said, my people are religious. But you're not saved by being religious. You're not saved because you've joined a Baptist church or a Methodist church or a Presbyterian church or a Catholic church. And the church is very important and very wonderful in the sanctification, in the Christian growth of the believer. The church is very, very important. But you're not saved. Nowhere in the Bible are we taught that salvation comes by church membership. I have a preacher friend one day who was standing in a hotel lobby and the man walked up to him and said, are you a minister? My friend said, yes. The man said, what church? My preacher friend said, I'm a Baptist. Oh, the man said, you're a Baptist. He said, you're a member of that narrow, narrow church that believes that only your gang is going to heaven. My preacher friend said, you're mistaken. I'm more narrow than that. I don't believe some of my gang are going to make it. <laughs> so you're not saved by religion. You remember in the seventh chapter of Matthew in verse 21 that Jesus said, not everyone that saith Lord, Lord, because you have an orthodox vocabulary, not everyone that saith Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of God, but he that doeth the will of my Father. You know what's the will of the Father for the unsaved man? To accept Christ as personal Savior. That's why in 1 John 2, 17, the writer said, The world passeth away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. He's simply saying any man who accepts Christ as personal Savior will never be lost again. That's what he means. He that do it, you see in 1 Peter 3, 9, it says that God willeth that none should perish, but that everyone should come unto repentance. God wants every human being to kneel at the foot of the cross and be saved. That's God's desire, like it was Paul's desire for the Jews to be saved. And so you can say, Lord, Lord, you can have the name on your lips and not have the reality in your life. We're not saved by religion. People say, well, I read the Bible and I pray and I go to church. So did Nicodemus. But Christ said, you must be born again. And so number two, we're not saved by religion. 
Number three, we're not saved by right living. Point number three, we're not saved by right living. We're not saved by right living. Verse three, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness, God's salvation, God's perfect transmission of his own righteousness and perfection to the credit of the unsaved man by imputation, by transfer. They're ignorant about that. What happens? They go about to establish their own righteousness. And Dr. C.H. Dodd, who's done the best work in the Greek in the book of Romans, says the word established there, the word dasis, is an architectural work, word. It's the word of a builder, a man putting a stone and then putting another one on top of that and according to design, creating a structure. And so they get busy. And they say, I'm going to do it. I'm going to save myself by not being bad or by being good or by doing good works. They go about to establish their own righteousness and they have not, listen, submitted themselves unto the righteousness that comes from God. And the word submit in the Greek is the word hupago. And Dr. C.H. Dodd says, that's a military word. It's a word meaning surrender. It means I give up. I cannot do it. You do it. You take over. That's what it means to submit and to say, Lord, I cannot save myself. A man can no more save himself than a flat tire can fix itself. A flat tire can be fixed, but somebody else must do it. And a man can be saved, but somebody else must do it for him. And so we're not saved by human goodness. As wonderful as human goodness is. But all the Bible is vociferous at this point. Remember the second chapter of Ephesians and verse 8, for by grace are we saved through faith and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God and not of works, lest any man should boast. Now he said, after you're saved, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus on two good works that God hath before ordained we should walk in them. So good works are the result of being saved, not the condition for it. And so we're not saved by human goodness, by loving our neighbor, by paying our debts, by being honest. Remember Titus 3, 5, not of works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saves us by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. And so salvation is something that God does for us. And we cannot do it for ourselves. Now, loving your neighbor, paying your debts, and being honest and being good is magnificent. And everyone should practice that humane conduct on a horizontal level that would uh, help society in a great way. But to verticalize what's horizontal and to say, Lord, you have to accept what I do for my fellow man as salvation, then that, of course, when you do that, you're making human goodness the worst form of human badness. You remember in the seventh chapter of Matthew I referred to a while ago in verse 20 he said uh, in that day many shall come and say then we cast out devils in your name and in your name we prophesied and performed wonderful works and he said depart from me you workers of iniquity. Wait a minute. They were doing seemingly apparently on the surface good works but whenever you put good works in the place of divine righteousness you have done the most horrible thing you can possibly do. You are a worker of iniquity because you're saying God the cross of Jesus and the crucifixion of Christ was an appendage. It was unnecessary. I can save myself by human goodness. I can save myself by being nice and kind and decent. And I repeat again that these practices are commendable on the human level. And I am not depreciating the value of being courteous and being kind and being loving and being helpful. But don't ever make any combination of human goodnesses equal what God did for the race on the old rugged cross. You see, Christ died because there is no other way. And Calvary stands as a mute reminder that salvation comes by the love of God and not by the life of man. That salvation comes by the grace of God and not by the goodness of man. That salvation comes by the provision of God and not by the purity of man. And so... We're not saved by right living. You know, I have often said if you could resurrect the thousand best people that ever lived, call the roll. 
Let's call the roll. Mary, the virgin mother of our Savior. Paul, the great apostle. Simon Peter, the wonderful man. And all, come all the way down through history and resurrect the thousand best people that ever lived. And then from each one, take his best. And then synthesize those thousand goodnesses into one human being. Wouldn't there be a terrific person with all that combined character of all the ages wrapped up in one person? If that could be done, if that could be done, that person with all that synthesized character would still have to kneel at the foot of the cross and say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Let me show you how a human goodness, how a, go a good thing can become horrible by misplacement. Take, for example, what if I were to say, I'm tired of breathing. I've been breathing now all these years, day in, day out, week in, week out, moment in, moment out, inhaling and exhaling. I'm tired of breathing. I think from now on, I'll just comb my hair in the place of breathing. No more breathing, I'll just comb hair. So I withdraw my comb from my pocket and I stop breathing and start combing. How long do I comb? Well, you know how the brain needs oxygen and all the other tissues need oxygen. I don't comb too long. And after a while, after a while, the hand slows down and then my hand drops and then I drop and then that's it. Now, I know if you're technical, you say, well, but uh, then the automatic system takes over. You know when little boys and little girls lose their temper sometimes and beat their head against the wall and hold their breath and pass out and mama goes into a panic and into a shock. Mother, don't uh, panic. They'll be back. <laughs> Because when they faint, well, then the automatic system takes over. But I'm just trying to show you that if it were possible to substitute a good thing, hair combing, in the place of breathing, I would make hair combing murder, suicide. You see, a good thing has become horrible by misplacement. Combing your hair is good. Everybody should comb his hair. Nothing wrong with combing your hair if you've got some. <laughs> But hair combing is no place for breathing, not, cannot take the place of breathing. Never, never. And so salvation, the salvation that God offers the human race, the salvation God offers the human race is, uh, you cannot replace it by human activity, by human goodness. And so men are not saved by race, men are not saved by right living, men are not saved by religion. Number four, men are saved by a redeemer. There's the answer. Christ. Look at verse four. Christ is the end of the law. And by the way, the phrase, end of the law, uh, telos tonomon, means the end of men trying to do it for themselves or living by rules and keeping commandments and not doing this and doing the other. That Christ ended all that because by his cross he was simply saying you can't do it that way. For righteousness or salvation to everyone who believeth. And that's why in Acts 4, 12, Peter could say, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no name under heaven or given among men whereby we might be saved. And the singularity of salvation is again emphasized in 1 Corinthians 3, 11. Other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ. And John 1, 12 tells that same story. He came unto his own, and his own received him not, but to as many as did receive him. To them he gave the authority to become the sons of God because they believed on his name. When the Philippian jailer came to Paul and said, What must I do to be saved? Did Paul say, Give up your sins? No. Did he say, uh, Start doing good works? No. Did he say, Join somebody's church and be baptized? No. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, the word believe, the Greek word pistuo, Dr. Consulman, a great Greek scholar, contends it means transfer of responsibility. That you cannot translate the word into English in just one word, believe. You have to almost say a whole sentence, says Dr. Consulman. Let somebody else do for you what you cannot do for yourself. That's what it means. It means you're saying, Lord, take over, take over. I cannot save myself. I trust you. I put my faith in you. You know, before he was born in Matthew 1, 21, Christ came to Mary. Rather, the angel, an angel came to Mary while she was carrying the fetal Christ in her body and said, I've got a name for your baby. You'll call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. He didn't say he'll save his people from poverty, as wonderful as that would have been. Didn't say he'll save his people from ignorance as wonderful as education is. But he said he'll save them from their sins. 
because that's the problem with human existence. And John the Baptist could point to him in verse 129, chapter 1, verse 29 of John, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2, the writer said, Jesus is a payment for our sins. The King James says propitiation. The Greek is hilasmos, which means a payment. Jesus is a payment for our sins and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. So Christ is the answer. Young people tonight, men and women tonight, boys and girls tonight, come to Jesus. Let the touch of his infinite love bring meaning to your life in time and in eternity. This is something everybody has to do, must do. Salvation is an imperative, not something optional. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes.